Okay, I see it's 6 o'clock and I'm going to be calling the. Um, Transportation advisory board meeting for March 14, 2022 to order. May we have the roll call. Sandra Stewart present. Liz Osborne. Courtney Michelle. Here. David McInerney. Present. Steve Laner. Here. Diane Christ. Council Member Yarbrough. Joe Long. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting for February 14th, 2022 <clears throat> for the Transportation Advisory Board meeting? Courtney? Approve the minutes. Is there, a, is there a second? A second. Liz? Liz, Liz seconded? Liz. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes from the February 14th, 2022 meeting. Um, are there, is there any discussion? Yes, David. Just a couple of comments on um, page five of the minutes. Second sentence of the first paragraph. There's a phrase uh, wouldn't hurt Longmont's chances. That should be would hurt Longmont's chances. We were talking about some funding proposals. And also, it'd be good to correct the date in the minutes heading on pages two through nine. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Any other discussion? Okay, it's been uh, moved. Uh, and uh, we, all those that approved the uh, minutes with the stated uh, corrections signify by saying yes. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, so it's been moved. It's been approved. All right. Thank you. Communication from staff. Bill. Thank you, Chair Stewart. Um, well, we're working on our first meeting here without Tyler staying at the helm. So hopefully I can kind of make sure we um, still move forward and have a, have a productive TAV. <laughs> um, but I, I suspect uh, Tara will have a lot more to do with that than me, but uh, I really appreciate uh, all the folks that uh, didn't, were able to show up. And we do have a lot of folks from RTD on, on as well. I did want to let you know that we do have uh, uh, an upcoming meeting. It's a Colorado 119 or State Highway 119 membership meeting on, on April 6th. And you do have to kind of pre-register for it, but it's open to everyone. And it's, uh, here's the tagline. Um, I hope you know who joining, who commuting solutions are, but they're the group that kind of works along US 36 and 119 and the whole Northwest area here is including 287. It says join commuting solutions for an exclusive opportunity to influence regional transportation planning and funding and network with members from different sectors. So that's the tagline for this event. It really does key in on the diagonal highway. So we're hoping uh, you all can attend, or even if a few of you can attend, that would be wonderful, just to kind of get a flavor of what's going on. We'll have some folks there from RTD as well and Colorado Department of Transportation, um, as well as Boulder County, City of Boulder, all the folks that are kind of uh, working along the diagonal there. And then you'll see that I sent uh, information and I, I hope you all were able to get a, a copy of the link to the meeting that was held uh, last, Monday before last Monday. And so um, just wanted to make sure you had that information uh, moving forward. So I think that's it from staff. I'll invite other staff members. Uh, uh, you know, Jim, Caroline, Ben are all staff as well. Uh, I just asked them if they had anything uh, to, uh, to add, but we did not hear anything more. So I'm going to say, um, unless you have something we can move on. Jim, did you have anything specifically? 
Um, not specifically in regards to the meeting, um, but just as a an informational item, um, city staff. Uh, I think everybody's heard a lot about uh, the infrastructure bill that's that's has moved through Congress. Um, as money's starting to kind of float out to the states, uh, staff will be meeting um, in the I think tomorrow to start going through and reviewing some of the grants. Um, to, to see where our best opportunities will be. We're gonna have staff from LPC, uh, Public Works, uh, Phil, I think is is involved in that in planning, um, broadband or broadband next light uh, community services. So a broad broad group of city city staff kind of triaging a lot of the grants to find out where we're gonna chase money, what are our best opportunities. Um, some of the continuing programs we have will will be focusing on trying to leverage some of the city dollars with additional grant dollars. So uh, that's the, the latest kind of, um, it's still in process as to what we're going to be looking at, um, but uh, we have a group of city staff who are, are going to begin that process. Great. And then one last, one last thing, just uh, we're having issues with, and I just wanted to reach out to Stacy. Stacy and Jane are both on as well from staff, so sorry about that. But uh, uh, Stacy, if you can give uh, Manas the uh, permissions to share her screen, she's got the, the presentation from RTD later. So I just wanna make sure she has permissions to be able to uh, share her screen so she can do the presentation. If not, let me know and we can do it through, through mine. Great, thank you. Any other staff? Okay. All right. Um, public invited to be heard. Do we have any public in waiting? I'm not seeing anybody on there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no action items. Okay. So we're ready for the information items. Um, and I'll turn that over to Phil for RTD. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna start by introducing uh, Director Geisinger, Lynn Geisinger from, she represents our Boulder, um, kind of more of the Boulder, the Western side of Longmont. I'm actually in her district, just West of Hover. So many of us are, and we don't even realize it. So um, um, we'll start with uh, Director Geisinger and then Director Davis is going to come in at the, the end. He represents more of the center of Longmont down to Broomfield and kind of that um, east of Hover section. So he'll be coming out at the end. He's been traveling. So he's just getting back from his travels and he's been kind enough to join us. But with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Director Geisinger for a couple of comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm Lynn Geisinger, as, as Phil said, and I uh, serve Western Boulder County, Boulder, Louisville, Longmont, up in the mountain, uh, Louisville, Superior, up in the mountains. And right now I represent the Southwest corner of Longmont, as Phil was saying, we just um, approved a redistricting map that does give me a little more of, of Western Longmont. But um, I'd say you know, Eric Davidson, who represents uh, the, the rest of Boulder County and, and also represents Bloomfield County, and I work very closely together. We consider ourselves both representing the Northwest Corridor. And um, so I think, uh, I think we consider Longmont and, and all of the different areas. We have a bit, a bit of different focus, but mostly we, we feel like we're working together on them. Um, we did just pass a redistricting map where uh, we each represent about 205,000 people. And um, you know, it's great to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I think we have a real A team with Natalie Handlos and Chris also coming. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of what's been in the press lately and uh, some of, much of that does come back to Northwest Rail and Chris Quinn will be talking about that, but I will uh, just talk a little bit about the board's view and some of where we are on that. Um, and then I represent, I, I uh, chair, well, I have chaired the Government Relations Committee. It's part of the Executive Committee now. I serve as first vice chair. So there are a couple of really interesting things happening in the legislature that I want to tell you about as well. So um, uh, you may have seen or heard the, the uh, three-part series in the Denver Post and the podcast Ghost Train. And, and then just a week or so ago, the um, 
Denver Post editorial, all of which go back sort of and, and look at uh, the history of RTD and uh, kind of what needs to what needs to change, what's happening now. I think they all give uh, uh, some interesting background. And um, while I don't share uh, agree with all the particulars, I think one thing that's happening now that's exciting is reflected in all of those, which is that in the as they end up, they're all talking about the need for additional funding for transit. If we're going to meet our goals in this region around equity and around greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, then uh, we do need to, to build up the transit service, and that's going to require more money. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, Northwest Rail is, is one of the topics that Chris will be talking about tonight. And I guess I don't have a lot of update from what I think you must probably already know, but uh, the big news right now is that RTD, the board has funded uh, an $8 million study on Northwest Rail. So we know that we have the numbers we need, what the costs will be, what the engineering issues will be, at least in part, what uh, ridership we can expect to have, and that'll help us all make better decisions. Um, the board, while they're not uh, all, you know, fans of this of the Northwest Rail project, we ended up 10 to 2 voting to move this project forward. Um, and Chris will be telling you, I think, now that we've hired a consultant and uh, are ready to jump in on that. Last thing I wanted to mention was uh, are there, there are two bills in the legislature. There's actually one bill and one that we're expecting very soon that I think uh, are pretty exciting. One of them is um, that the governor in his budget um, included $28 million for fare free transit during part of the ozone season this, this summer. And uh, we've worked through that. There are two big issues really that RTD is working hard to solve. And one of them is the financial piece, which we've mentioned. And we did get a lot of money out of the federal um, ARP and, and CARES and CRIS acts um, during the pandemic, but looking to, to stretch that. And the other is workforce issues. We've been, if you ride the bus, you'll you know that we have had to cancel um, routes because we're, we're just so low on workforce. But there's a collective bargaining agreement in the process. And uh, our new uh, CEO is working hard to try to try to bring in new workers and, and uh, solve that problem. So uh, assuming we can work on those things, I mean, assuming that we can help to solve those things, um, we well, either way, we're moving forward with doing fare free transit for the month of August. And um, I think it's a really exciting step that we're taking. And again, the excitement, part of the excitement that I feel around that is that um, we're getting a lot of community support. Uh, Metro mayors sent a letter this week with 26 mayors representing 70% of the region that signed it saying, we want to support this and we want to help you with the security issues. The security issues really are around people riding that are not are destinationless that don't get off the bus if the bus is free. So um, Mayor Peck signed that letter as did many of the other members up here, the Colorado Forum, a number of members of the environmental community. A lot of people are coming together to say, this is a great project. Let's try to do this free fare um, transit in, during August and we wanna help. Finally, the other thing that I think um, is really interesting in the legislature, there's a bill HB 22-1026. And that bill takes what had been a 4% tax deduction for people buying uh, eco passes, bus passes, for, for businesses that bought bus passes or bike share passes um, and certain other types of alternate modes um, passes for their employees and turns it into a 50% tax credit so that if a business buys those sorts of uh, alternate transportation passes um, or support for their employees, they can deduct 50% of that. It's still working its way through the legislature. Um, it seems to have pretty good support. And again, I think that's another, another uh, exciting piece. So I'm gonna quit, let us move on to, uh, to the staff reports and then Eric will be back to finish up. And I believe 
that uh, Phil wants to do questions. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I believe he wants to do those at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Director Geisinger. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Natalie Hanlos to introduce the team and uh, get going on the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us back. <laughs> this is an annual thing now. We're, we're happy to be here. We have had a few staff changes, so just quick introduction. And if the uh, team, if you can turn your video on real quick to say hello, that would be wonderful. So I'm Natalie Hanlos. I'm the lead or senior service planner scheduler for North Team, which is pretty much anything north of I-70 within the RTD district. Um, we have Manas Subarama with us. She's our service planner and scheduler one still for right now between North Team and West Team. She's transitioning out of, out of North Team into West Team. Uh, we have also a new staff member, a new service planner scheduler one. His name is Greg Philklin. He started with us just a month ago. Hello. We have Chris Quinn with us, who is our project manager too from a planning, systems planning. And then we have Aaron Vallejos, who is now our senior manager and contractor service uh, for contractor services and anything and everything special services related. <laughs> so, thanks, team. I'm going to um, hand it over to Manis to start out, and then we're going to tag team the slideshow. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, cool. Uh, so just an overview of what we're going to cover in this presentation. We're providing updates on our fixed route services, special services, uh, feature plan service adjustments, as well as updates on uh, Northwest Rail, First and Main Station, and the State Highway 119 plan. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so starting off with the fixed route service update. Next slide. All right, so to start off, I'd like to note that we're still under the COVID-19 service plan, which has been in effect since um, April of 2020. Um, under the plan, initially, when uh, we initially went into this, um, we suspended several routes uh, throughout our service area and um, um, and uh, had operated to several of our routes under the uh, under Saturday service for our week uh, on weekdays. Um, and since then, we have been um, solely bringing back service uh, either through um, incre we increased the service span of the routes or added in trips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, we I think at the beginning of the uh, when we went into the COVID service plan initially, we were providing 60% of pre-pandemic pre service while carrying 40% of the pre-pandemic ridership. And currently we're providing 70% of the pre-pandemic service levels while having 50% uh, of the ridership. Um, uh, within Longmont, we have uh, sus currently suspended the routes uh, J and LX. Um, they are suspended and uh, we are looking to bring them back once we have, um, once it's warranted and once we have um, yeah, enough operators and uh, resources and stuff. Um, and overall, yeah, we have increased the uh, the service hours uh, for most of our uh, Longmont routes. The LD, uh, as of the um, September on board, we did bring back a few LD3 trips uh, in the midday. Um, yeah, next slide, please. All right, and this uh, is our uh, average boardings for our weekdays. Um, uh, in these uh, August run boards for each of these years, uh, except with the exception of uh, 2020 and 2021, we are using August run board data for 2020 and 2021. We're using September run board data since we did not have an August run board, we had a September run board. Um, and I wanted to wrote, uh, note that uh, the route L was uh, split into the routes LD and LX in August 2017, which is why we don't see uh, we don't see any data for the route L past uh, 2017. Overall, before the pandemic, we have been, uh, we were seeing kind of an increase and then a, a pretty stable ridership levels. And then once uh, the pandemic hit, of course, we had a drastic uh, uh, reduction in our ridership. But uh, since then, we are seeing a slow but steady increase in our ridership um, for all our routes, which is great. And uh, <laughs> we're really happy to see that. And we're hoping that we, this trend continues um, as, we, as we progress. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is our uh, 
these, uh, this is uh, specifically our local lab boarding. So uh, all the 300 routes, 323, 324, 326, and uh, 327 within Longmont. Um, as you can, uh, if you look at the graph there, I'm sorry, not the graph, the chart there, um, we did see sort of a, um, we, we were seeing pretty much an increase through, uh, through the pre-pandemic. And then once uh, 2020 hit, we had a, uh, sixty percent decrease, which is um, on par with what uh, we were seeing throughout the system. We uh, we were carrying only about forty percent of our pre-pandemic ridership, but the, uh, in twenty twenty one we did see a fifty percent increase um, from twenty twenty levels, which is great to see. And um, again, we're hoping that it's a trend that continues uh, as we uh, move forward. Next slide, please. Um, and these are the regional route boardings. Uh, so that includes the routes Bolt, LD, J, L, and LX. As I stated before, the uh, routes J and LX have been suspended under the COVID-19 plan. So they've been suspended since April of 2020. Um, and the route L was split into the routes LD and LX in um, August, 2017. Um, and the with the pandemic, the our regional routes did take a lot, um, a big hit to ridership because most of our ridership is a commuter or they, they uh, or riders to see you. But um, as the uh, classes have opened up, I mean, schools have opened up and uh, some businesses are bringing their employees back to the office, we are seeing an increase in that ridership as well. Um, yeah. And uh, I do want to note that our the fair buy up was initiated in uh, July of 2015. And so we did uh, see some ridership uh, increase with that when that happened. Um, yeah, next slide, please. All right, um, and I'll hand it over to Aaron Vallejos to provide a the uh, update for special, special services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so similar to what we're experiencing on the fixed route side, I will say that FlexRide is experiencing um, challenges in hiring operators as well. Uh, so I do just wanna note that at the beginning of our presentation. And kind of as you can see, um, since entering into the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, there really have not been a lot of changes to service. But I do want to note that at the beginning of this year, without uh, needing additional operator resources, we were able to extend service hours from 5.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the hopes that as we saw more people start to go back to the office, that might better accommodate um, some of our commuter writers a little bit better. So we are operating 27 weekday hours um, under the current service plan as opposed to 24. So not completely back to the 35.5 uh, at the peak pre-pandemic, but we have um, made some strides in again, improving our service hours without uh, needing additional operator resources, which is a really great thing to be able to do. Uh, next slide, please. And then, as you can see, similar to our fixed route service, we did see a pretty substantial decrease in ridership. Um, you know, we were kind of holding our own and then in 2020, it definitely dropped. We have seen an increase in 2021. Uh, January wasn't quite as high as I was hoping, but February, we were actually up to a little bit over 70 weekday boardings uh, per day. So I'm hoping that trend continues. We'll obviously monitor that closely. Uh, right now, we don't have any plans to change service in the May run board, um, but we will be looking at September as um, schools continue to be back in session and see um, kind of what service warrants at that time. And that is really all for my update. Next slide, please. Hey, thank you, Erin. I'll take the next couple slides. Next slide, please, Phil. All right. So just a quick, uh, I guess, revisit, reminder. We presented this last time and the year before because it has been in place since the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, as we completed the, SA, the State Highway 119 PEL. With the PEL, we included an adjustment to the Longmont local network. We conducted that through an external consultant team, as well as in really close coordination with City of Longmont staff. That document is, is 
included in the final State Highway 119 BRT project document. And it would be implemented in phases. And as our situation, as others have mentioned, with the lack of resources and operators, as we move forward into State Highway 119 BRT, which is slated for late 2024, beginning 2025, we will look to start phasing part of the State Highway 119 BRT, that being the Bolt and the J. And uh, there, there are two patterns that are similar to what the Bolt and the J do currently that will move forward into the State Highway 119 BRT uh, plan and operations. So looking hopefully for January 2023 to start phasing the BRT better regional transit at this point rather than <laughs> bus rapid transit because none of the components have been built yet on State Highway 119. But with that, we will also look to see if there are potential adjustments to the local plan that would make sense. All of this is included in what is our system optimization plan under the reimagine study. And it does include the routings of the four local routes, the service levels, the service spans, as well as stop locations. Next slide, please. So just for a visual real quick, on the left side is the current network. You can see the 326, 327, 323 is the green, 324 is the sort of brown or purplish. <laughs> and on the right-hand side is what is proposed to be the feeder network for the State Highway 119 BRT, which we would look to see what would make sense to start phasing. So if we start phasing the Bolt and J as uh, kind of mimicking what is in the State Highway 119 BRT plan, then we would also look to perhaps, I'm gonna say the 323 and the 324 as first routes to have adjustments to help uh, provide local service to those regional routes. Yet we haven't decided on that yet. We will have conversations and communications and um, planning with City of Longmont staff to see what they think would be best. And then obviously, as with any of this, we would have to take it through a regular public process. We won't do any of this until the system optimization plan is approved in one way or another by the RTD board. So again, looking for January 2023 to start making some of these changes, yet can't promise anything, especially since we don't know what the resources, what our, our situation is going to be with the operators at hand. Next slide. So just real quick as to what the changes in the platform hours and service levels would be. So you can see that current, which is actually current, <laughs> is, uh, is at 114 roughly weekday hours, and it would be increased to a total of 135, which is an increase of 21 plus hours per day weekday, average weekday. For the weekend, we currently operate about 62, 62 and a half hours. For Saturday, that's proposed to be increased by about the 13, 14 hours to 76. And on Sundays, where we currently operate 21 hours, we're proposing to increase that quite a bit, but um, increase of 32 hours overall, which would take it to 53. So that is a significant increase on Sunday service. Again, all depends on when we can implement this as to resources available and how we're moving forward with the State Highway 119 BRT. Next slide. And I'll hand it over to Chris Quinn to give an update on Northwest Rail and some more information on State Highway 119 BRT. Thanks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I had to switch rooms. Um, just a little bit of background on the Northwest Rail. Um, I know there's a few new members on the TAC, so I know those of you who have been current, have previously been on, have probably already seen this and know this. But one of the things that I just want to emphasize that makes this corridor unique and a little bit more challenging than any of the other fast tracks corridors is the fact that this is the only corridor where RTD has not been able to completely obtain the right of way. Um, BNSF own, currently owns and will continue to own the corridor, even if 
and when passenger rail service is established there. Additionally, BNSF will continue to operate their freight service through the corridor, which creates quite a bit of the challenge uh, associated with the corridor. Um, the full build out of the corridor does require a double track configuration. Currently, there's only a single track configuration. Um, but we hope as part of the starter service that I'll talk about in just a moment that we can function with uh, minimal capital investments and improvements to the corridor. So when we're talking about, uh, oh, could uh, next slide, please. I was trying to do it on my end, forgetting that I don't have it. Let's see, I'm getting a bad signal. I'm gonna turn off my camera for just a moment. So, as Director Geisinger mentioned a little bit earlier, we are now starting to look at a Northwest Peak service. And by this, we mean we'd be running service during the AM and the PM rush hour. The intent of it is how can we minimize the required investment for the corridor? Uh, as I noted in the previous slide, the expectation is to run the full service, we would have to have a full double track system from Longmont to Boulder to Denver. But what if we were to be able to just rely on the single track that's already out there, maybe some passing tracks at the stations. The hope is that that could significantly reduce the cost. So the plan that we're looking at would have three trains in the morning that would originate in Longmont, head to Boulder and then to Denver, and then the reverse in the afternoon. So three three trains starting at Union Station that would make their way up the corridor to Boulder and then back to Longmont. The reason we have uh, engaged a consultant and that consultant is HDR Engineering is to help us better define exactly what that project would be. A couple of years ago, we did, staff did an internal estimate um, based on very very high level planning assumptions. Um, we really basically just kind of looking at maps. We didn't really have any meaningful input from the BNSF, which as I emphasized, does still own and will continue to own the corridor. So by, by having a consultant on board, we really want to take a deep dive, start looking at what are the real cost, what would the real cost of this be? what would some of the environmental impacts be? Also, want to get a better sense of how the operations would work, keeping in mind that we would have to integrate the services with the existing BNSF freight services. How do we get all of those to fit together? Um, what, as I said, oh, the environmental impacts. And then also by doing this, you know, one of the things about this corridor with the starter service, since we never really have done any serious evaluation of it, we don't even know whether or not we could be eligible for any kind of state, local, federal grants. Uh, but until we have enough information, we, you know, we're ineligible to apply for those. Now, the study is expected to take about 2.5 years. Oh, and it is one of the other components that I didn't mention in the slide. So we'll also be looking at what kind of maintenance would be required. And in this particular case, that would mean a new maintenance facility for the specific commuter rail vehicles. Our expectation is that that maintenance facility would be somewhere up in Longmont. And we have already started discussions with the city on whether or not there could be any possibilities of finding a site east of Main Street, uh, you know, somewhere between Main Street and the sugar mill uh, facility. So we're uh, continuing to work there. And then one other thing I also wanna mention, we did have a meeting with local stakeholders and the BNSF back in February. Uh, basically, it was, a, it was a very high level technical, or I guess that's kind of a contradiction, so kind of a, a technical uh, meeting uh, just to go over some of what the assumptions could be as we move into this study, uh, just things on, you know, basic things on track, geome track geometry, curvature, that sort of stuff. Um, so nothing really to report on that, but, uh, as I mentioned, we do hope to work through this in a, like the two to two and a half year time frame. And again, the, really what we want to get out of this is just a common understanding, common set of facts of what the core, what it would take to establish the corridor and how we might move it forward. Next slide, please. 
And then one other element that's sort of in the background to all of this is CDOT has established the uh, uh, had established a front range passenger rail association. And one of the things that they were looking at is the possibility of running rail from Fort Collins down to uh, Colorado Springs and even further south potentially. One of the key corridors that came out of their final recommendations was in the north part anyway, between Denver and Fort Collins, would be using the existing BNSF corridor, which does go from uh, Fort Collins, Loveland, Berthoud, Longmont, and then following the Northwest Rail Corridor down to Boulder and into Denver. Of the three final, uh, the three final corridors that are recommended to move forward for further consideration, the BNSF corridor is uh, the one that was recommended for further evaluation, uh, for more environmental review. Um, and I'm, as you see the second bullet there kind of quotes verbatim from the report on why they felt it to be a corridor that should uh, be out for further consideration. So CDOT has released a request for proposals from consultants to conduct further review. So they're kind of doing the exact same thing for that full corridor that we are doing for the peak service. We've been in very close discussions with them to make sure that our efforts uh, overlap or that we can share information and keep each other apprised of our progress so that you know anything that one side does doesn't preclude uh, the other from being able to move forward with their plans. So quite a bit of activity in the corridor right now. Um, next slide, please. And then a real quick first and main street update, a main, main first and main station update. Just a little bit of background here. Uh, back in 2011, uh, the RTD board committed $17 million to establishing a multimodal center at first and main street. The intent of it was that uh, recognizing that this would be the terminus of the rail. Um, what could we do to establish that as an intermodal center until the train comes? Uh, this is a station that would be used as part of the State Highway 119 BRT network, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. But we've been working pretty closely with the city uh, and the city and RTD jointly conducted what is known as an IMP or an infrastructure master plan. And the intent of that was to come up with the engine just enough engineering to determine how to move forward with future agreements and some of the items that the uh, the plan addressed were making sure we had the boundary survey uh, also recognizing the complexity of the drainage situation in that area um, what are the existing utilities how could they be utilized and then also determining what the multimodal transportation services would look like how would the bus network integrate with the future train and just general transportation or uh, in and out of the site for any future users. The next steps in that process are we are working with uh, the city on an intergovernmental agreement to determine how the flow of funds would work as we uh, come up with final design and uh, build the facility. Next slide, please. And then uh, Natalie will talk a little bit about how the future how the bus operations would integrate with the site when it opens. Thanks. Great, thank you, Chris. So yes, uh, proposed future operations. So definitely, obviously, we will look to serve the station with all of the local 300s, and that would include the uh, new 300 routes that are within the local uh, Longmont local network that is in a, attached to the State Highway 119 BRT. We would look to have flex right and accessor right here, of course. Also, the regional routes as they would operate depending on phasing. And then with the future BRT patterns, we would also look to potentially have flex from transport serve the station and um, potentially also CDOT bus tank routes as they had looked at um, some operations east west potentially to help with building out the network overall. The access and use will depend on a few things. So one, of course, the completion of the station structure, um, the completion of Kaufman Busway, because we will need to be able to access the station through Kaufman Busway. 
also, uh, especially not, and I believe I'm breaking it out because Kaufman Busway, my understanding is from third to ninth, tenth, eleventh, up ninth, tenth, eleventh, yeah, <laughs> versus the completion of first and second, that those are going to be um, different timing. So we'd have to have both of those sections completed before we would really be able to access the station as we are planning to do uh, once it's completely open. We would also look to access via Boston from the west side, but again, you would need that uh, road connection completed. Can't repeat it enough, operations are going to be phased and they're going to depend on resources available as well as warranted per demand. So as we move forward, we'll all be taking a very, very close look at what the ridership is, what the demand is, travel patterns, et cetera. Um, again, that's one of the other reasons why we're looking to start phasing the State Highway 119 BRT in January of 2023 so that we can gather some data ahead of actually opening it in end of 24, 25, and make sure that we have the patterns the way they need to be, that they match where the demand is, as well as obviously service level and service span. So next slide, please. Back to Chris. Okay. Now, next slide, please. So back in, it seems so long ago now, back in 2019, RTD working with the local stakeholders and CDOT completed what is known as a planning and environmental linkages study for the State Highway 119 corridor. And the intent of that was to evaluate how BRT could work, bus rapid transit could work from Longmont to Boulder utilizing the diagonal. Coming out of the uh, PEL, the vision plan was for BRT managed lane. So it'd be something similar to US 36 where buses, high occupancy vehicles, and anyone willing to pay a toll could use the new lanes for free. And those would run along the uh, highway portion of the diagonal. It also called for, the plan also called for a busway on Kaufman Street and a bikeway along the corridor, as well as improvements to the bus stops uh, within both Boulder and Longmont. Now, CDOT started uh, pro probably about a year ago, a what they're calling the 119 Safety and Mobility Project. And that has determined that at least in the near term, the managed lanes, so again, those would be the toll bus HOV lanes, probably wouldn't be feasible uh, due to the at-grade signalized intersections, uh, but they do want to keep that in the long-term plan. So instead, what CDOT is working on now, uh, it would be for the corridor transit services to rely on queue jumps. And next slide, please. So what the queue jumps would do, would they, be, they would allow buses to bypass the congestion at signalized intersections. Um, specifically, they would be at all of the signalized intersections along the corridor, starting on the south end, J, uh, J Road, 63rd Street, uh, State Highway 52, Niwot. Uh, again, allow what they would do, and you can see it in the graphic here, the worst congestion that happens in the corridor is, of course, at the signalized intersections. So by providing the queue jumps, it allows a bypass lane for the buses to jump around the congestion and then be right up front at the traffic signal and then be first out when, uh, when the light turns green. CDOT is also looking at adaptive signaling as well as transit signal priority. And transit signal priority, or TSP, something that gives the bus an advantage. So as an example, if the light's about to turn red and it, the system detects a bus, company, a bus coming, it will hold the green light a little bit longer or change the phasing so that the bus, again, has a little bit of a travel time advantage. The project would also include, at least along the trunk line, new park and ride facility, or I'm sorry, not along the trunk line, within the whole corridor, a new park and ride facility at Park Ridge Avenue, and that's roughly at US 287 and State Highway 66 uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the Walmart. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, enhanced bus stops within Longmont and Boulder. So CDOT is leading an engineering study right now uh, for the final design of that project. And we now have enough information through the design process that it's put us, it's made us 
collectively eligible to start applying for various grant funds that are out there. Uh, Boulder County is leading an effort uh, to apply for $5 million for some of the uh, queue jumps, as well as a bikeway that would run through the corridor. Um, that is a grant through the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, we're fairly confident that that's something that could be awarded. And then RTDC dot um, Boulder and Longmont are also working on a potential federal grant that would also provide some additional elements of funding for the corridor. So, next slide. And I think that's all we have. So happy to try to respond to any questions that anyone might have. Do we have any questions from the board? Yes, Liz. You're muted. Yeah, but it's real soft. Okay, I can hear you. We can hear you. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I really appreciated seeing that map of the proposed and I realize we're all proposed here. I just want to comment. It seemed to me. It would be nice if to think about it would be nice if a bus got to the St. Brain innovation oh. center. Um, I think that there's a lot of things happening that young people in the St. Brain Valley School District would be benefited if they had access to, and it didn't look like any of those routes went there. That was just my comment. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Noted. Anyone else? David. Yes, I just wanted to uh, thank all of the RTD representatives for the information. My question is whether RTD planning envisions cooperating with um, rideshare companies like Uber and Lyft to provide uh, first and last mile services for the transit system. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Chris. Uh, one of the things we, we're also doing a kind of a parallel effort to everything else going on is what we're calling a reimagine RTD. And part of that effort uh, includes uh, what we're calling a, a mobility plan for the future, where we are looking at, you know, recognizing that the future of transit's not going to be just buses and trains. What are the things that we can do to start partnering with other rideshare uh, providers so that we can do what is known as a mobility on mobility as a service, mobility on demand? Um, now, as Aaron Vallejos earlier mentioned, you know, we do have we already do have the existing system of call and rides. Uh, and we have those throughout the district, but we have been looking at where are our, where are our opportunities to integrate our services with theirs. And we have done a couple of pilot projects. Also, at this point, with I cannot rem I cannot remember whether it's Uber or Lyft. If you do try, if you do call for a ride, it'll also tell you what your transit options are, as well as allow you the ability to buy your RTD ticket through the uh, through the uh, rideshare app. So we're really in the initial stages of exploring what those opportunities could look like, but recognize uh, again that that's probably going to be the future of you know of how we move forward, how we move forward, so. When you design a transit stop or a park and ride now, does it include um, accommodating safe and efficient pickup and drop off from those kinds of providers? A good question, yeah, since, you know, we haven't opened any park and rides very recently, but that is one of the things that we're definitely looking at on the State Highway 119 corridor is, yeah, recognizing that uh, from the, as you pointed out, the first and final mile perspective, how are people going to get, to the, recognizing that people aren't going to access these services just by cars. So what do we need to do to accommodate bike share, um, you know, in the case of Denver scooters, any other means of getting to the station besides just cars? So short answer to your question, yes. Thank you. Just to add to that, many of our park and rides have what we call the kiss and ride um, areas. 
and Uber Lyfts and taxi services, they are allowed to go into those areas to help basically provide those additional connections. That wasn't very clear from the sketch that we provided in the in the presentation tonight, but there is an area for Uber, Lyft, Kiss and Ride, taxis, all those different things that RTD now incorporates or has been incorporating into their design, but this one was very much uh, pointed toward Uber and Lyft as being two potential final mile pieces. So, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Any other questions? If there are no more questions, um, Director Davidson is on now for uh, from RTD to be able to uh, chat with you as well a little bit. And he is the director who represents the majority of, of Longmont Central. Thanks, Director Davidson. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Can you hear me okay? All right, thanks for bearing with me. I've, I've been on the go, so I've been audio only for most of this, but I'm glad the camera seems to be working for the moment. Um, it's good to see you all. Appreciate it. I, I won't take up too much time other than answer any other additional questions since I think a lot was covered. Um, I know earlier uh, Director Geisinger did address um, several items. I think just maybe two I'll, I'll, I'll add. One, just an emphasis on the SOP or the system optimization plan, which was part of the Reimagine RTD. Uh, we were able to extend out that time for feedback, and I just want to reach out and just say thank you for the feedback. We did receive quite a bit, at least, you know, I, I saw a fair amount coming in at the, the last minute there. Um, so I'm glad that we extended out the time and really, really appreciate the, the thoughtful organization that came from this entire region on that. So uh, I know that uh, we've already touched on that this evening and, and certainly our staff is working to uh, look for the intersection of all of that feedback. But the other thing I just wanted to uh, put out there is, uh, you know, the SOP really came from this uh, viewpoint of how do we optimize uh, and work within a constrained environment, both workforce and um, and financial resources. So as Director Geisinger mentioned, certainly one place that is good to see some of the press heading. Again, we may not agree with all of the particulars, but I, I think we all sort of recognize that uh, we, we, we do need to band together to uh, re-envision what the future, the longer term looks like here, and also look towards uh, ways to identify additional resources for, for transit funding. Um, so anyway, all that to say, thank you for the patience. Thank you for the feedback. Um, all the more important that we all band together on these kinds of things and, and work through them. There is one issue related to uh, Northwest Rail that I did want to bring to everybody's attention. It may be a little bit nuanced, um, so forgive me for this, but I, I did want to open the door to any feedback because it is largely a board and a policy issue. Uh, one of the challenges that we're facing as a result of fast tracks taking as long as it has is that we're approaching the 20 year mark, uh, the 20 year anniversary of the vote, of the 2004 vote. And the reason that that's important is that we have a bonding authority of around approximately half a billion dollars. And that bonding authority, it turns out that there's a, a fair amount of precedent in case law that bonding authority may not extend beyond 20 years. Um, we don't know the answer to that, we're looking into it. Uh, but simultaneously within our financial team, which I think is doing a stellar job these days of trying to really get our house in order, we've been taking advantage of lower interest rates, the historic lows that we're at, to refinance a lot of our debt. And we've recently found an opportunity to refinance uh, some of the debt that uh, went towards the end line and have found about $103 million worth of savings we could make that $103 million of savings 120, so an additional 17, but it calls for really using up substantial portion of our bonding authority. So we're really left in this place of now trying to understand case law and understand whether or not this bonding authority will go beyond the 20 year mark or whether we should take advantage of additional savings right now. I think what, you know, all of this arrives at, there are multiple things we can do to finance future fast tracks projects. Um, without getting into the details, although I'm happy to answer questions, one of the mechanisms is called a certificate of participation. RTD was actually an innovator on this front when it came to the end line uh, and, and leveraged uh, some of our assets as part of these COPs. 
Uh, that's something that we can do again in the future, and we're trying to decide how to balance out that uh, those future savings. So I just kind of wanted to let everybody know about this because if there's any financial minds out there that are very interested to get in the weeds and provide feedback, this will be a policy decision that the board will be making over the next two months as to whether we refinance for 103 million or refinance for 120. And underlying in that, I did want to just let everybody know that we are working very hard to find those savings right now because our debt service at RTD is very, very high from the way Fast Tracks was planned. And certainly one of the things that's blocking our future developments on Fast Tracks is that high debt service uh, that threatens to, to choke out the agency in future years. So we're looking for those savings. The team's doing a great job finding those savings, and we're starting to have some difficult decisions. Uh, the other reason I want to mention this is it did pop up in the news, uh, but it is not quite as simple as we're choosing to use up the bonds and they go away uh, and closing the door on it. It, it is going to be some, some nuance and some risk taking here. Um, so thank you for having us all. Really appreciate it. Thank you staff for the presentation. I'm certainly excited that we're going to move forward on getting those costs and a common set of facts on that, um, uh, that peak service plan. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Does anyone have a qu any questions for Eric? Or anybody else on RTD board. Okay, thank you. Thank you RTD for coming to us tonight and giving us an update. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thanks. Have a great night. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Okay, uh, I think our next item of information is our bylaws update. Phil, do you want to take us through that? Yeah, sure. Thank you for your patience on this. Uh, this is kind of a short one, actually, as the idea is that uh, this hasn't been updated in about nine years. So 2013 is the last time you've, or that the bylaws have been uh, looked at and revised. We've had a lot of changes since 2013. So we have a lot of, I mean, look at us right now, we're in, a, in, in an electronic meeting, right? That's not even included in the bylaw statement. So there's just certain things that need to be updated to make sure that we have the flexibility to do different things. We also changed our format of our, of the way that we do meetings. We got rid of old business and new business and put it into informational items and action items, which I think is more clear of what is being asked from the board. So. We kind of did that thinking that, oh, we're just changing the, uh, the agenda format, but it's actually in the bylaws that we're supposed to still have old business and new business as part of the discussion. So just a few things to change. And I'm, I apologize for not having the city attorney here, but the city, one of our city attorneys, uh, deputy city attorneys worked on this and put a lot of effort into just trying to clean things up. And so what this really is tonight is an introduction of the bylaw changes. And so you may have some, you may have read them already and, and uh, have some thoughts on what should change and what should not. But uh, I think at the next meeting, we're asking that the city attorney um, office send somebody to kind of guide us through making the changes. And then we'll make the, we have to make the official changes, give one week notice, um, official notice to the board of the proposed changes. And then you vote out them vote on them at your next at your next meeting. So um, I guess the proposal is is that if you have any changes that you wanted to see in the bylaws, we could chat about them tonight and then get them to the city attorney's office and see what they think. Uh, relay that information back to you as a board, probably via email so that we can look at these one last time at the next meeting and uh, either thumbs up or thumbs down, vote them in or vote them uh, back to, uh, you know, the drawing board of, of sorts. But uh, just wanted to get your opinion and get these in front of you and make sure that you had a chance to read them. And I didn't want to kind of spring them on you the week before a meeting to then vote on them in one way or another. So we're trying to give you as much time as we can, but we're 
also trying to make it, it's, it, it wasn't anything that was really on your work plan this year. So apologies for that, but we did need to make some changes. So with that, I turn it over to the board for any discussion. Yes, Liz. In section five voting, we have the, the city attorney commented about taking out raised hand, partly because we're currently meeting virtually. Um, it seemed to me though that here in the virtual meetings, which who knows what will happen in the future, it is nice to have the option to raise hand in case we're having this funny audio thing that we had tonight. And at least we can hold our hand up until you see it. And mm -hmm. and I think leaving that in would be a good thing to leave in. Just thank you. Point well taken. Thank you. Uh, Courtney. I agree with Liz. I thought that the hand raised, like we've never had a problem that seeing them and we hold them up until you're like, okay, I got everybody and I think we should leave that in there. And otherwise they seemed like reasonable changes just in, you know, a little bit of wording here or there. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Steve. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of raised in the document, Executive Secretary, is Stacy that by default right now, or do we have one that, that should be named? Or should that be changed to be uh, interchangeable? I shouldn't say interchangeable, but one or the other, Executive Secretary, or I guess, uh, what, city staff member? Phil, do you know? Which section are you looking at? Sorry. that I'm sorry. That would be... Um, oh, I see it. Yeah, the last, I think it's the last page at the very top. Executive My Secretary. Is that that is currently Stacy. Okay. okay. And then the above, you know, the city attorney or assistant actually asked who is the current executive yeah. secretary. I'm sorry, I think the executive secretary, the executive secretary was actually Tyler Staney before. Sorry. I think of him as um, as the staff liaison, but he, I think the executive summer secretary refers to to that position that Tyler held before, and I'm currently interim executive secretary, I believe. So, yeah. thank you. Great. <laughs> so, so it's you, Phil, right now. Okay. Correct. It says in the event, or it says the public works director or director's designee shall serve as the executive secretary, and I think that's the person who works. With the chair to establish the agenda, um, and and help run these meetings through, and and um, I think that I think that's it. Yes, I don't know, Jim, if you think otherwise or have a, a, another opinion, but I believe that's the way it's it works. I think that's I think that's stipulated in the code, isn't it, Phil? Yeah, and then it's also As defined well. under Section 10, where it's duties of officers, executive yeah. secretary is usually ex officio secretary of the board, the members of the board giving their name, time gratuitously, gratuitously and the deputy and the duty of the yeah. executive secretary, exec, executive secretary to prepare for the board all business that is assigned to it. So, yeah, yeah and that would, that, would, that would be the city traffic engineers is how we have run it in the past, and that would be. The title with the executive secretary for TAB. Thanks, Steve, for helping us clear that up. No, I, <laughs> I I was sure. That's great. Good, good information. Thank you for the, for the background. Any other thoughts about the bylaws? Yes, David. Just one editorial comment um, for section 14, the first sentence, you might want to check with the city grammarian as to whether that phrase that says whom shall be citizens at large should actually read who shall be citizens at large, WHO. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll bring this back next month, Phil. Our understanding, if you can think about it, and uh, we'll vote on it next meeting. Then, right? Is I that think that we need to said? make sure we need to make sure that these are publicly provided to you um, at least five days before the meeting to be legal. Okay. So we will do that, and then um, we'll ask for your vote, 
at the next meeting on whether you approve of the bylaws as amended tonight from what we talked about tonight. If you do have any other thoughts about the issue, please let us know in the next 21 days, right? So we can kind of get that out uh, before before the agenda goes out. But if you have any thoughts, let us know, and then we'll let the board know what changes came up in these in these three weeks to make sure you're aware of what changes were requested by other board members. But again, we can't have that discussion uh, in an email chain, so you have to just email either me or Stacy directly, and then with your comments, and then we'll get it out to the board and just let people know kind of where we're at. Ho hopefully we've taken care of everything at this meeting, but I know how it goes. It's something we always catch later on. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the board is aware of any other additional changes from this point forward and uh, make sure you know about it before we uh, ask you to vote on that. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, thoughts or questions for Phil? Okay. All right. Uh, comments from the board. Uh, David, do you have any comments for us this evening? No further comments. Okay, thank you. Diane, do you have any comments this evening? You are muted. Okay, we'll go to Steve. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, no, a good presentation by RTD. Um, and I appreciate Phil giving me the background on the executive secretary. All good. Thank you. Thank you. Courtney? Uh, it's always great to see the RTD. I remember when we first joined Sandra, we actually met them in person and they came mm -hmm. up to Lockdown, which was nice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm also wondering if we need to have any discussion about the Third Avenue and Francis issue that Phil had emailed us about the, the concerned citizen. Mm -hmm. I know there have been several meetings. It has not been brought up at the tab meetings and I'm wondering if we need to discuss that at all. Phil? Did you hear? Well, I, I think, yeah, I think I, I think I understand the basis of the, of the question and um, I'll probably turn it over to Jim Angstad to help answer the question. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so, um, a little bit of background. Uh, back in August of 2021, at a uh, coffee with council, several several residents vocalized some concerns regarding issues in and around uh, the third and Sherman uh, intersections. Um, and uh, so we were given direction by city manager to uh, take a look at it and they revolved around uh, um, clear lines of sight um, at both of those intersections, one going south, one going north, because it's an offset intersection where Sherman intersects with 3rd Avenue. So Tyler Stamey did a, a several field checks uh, over a course of several months. Um, in part, because when we first went out, we didn't identify any issues. Uh, and then we revisited the, the meeting minutes when they identified them as being in the evening hours. Um, so at each of those intersections in accordance with our standards, we did did while while. Uh, um, while the uh, West end tavern was in full swing, uh, we saw and identified a number of, of areas where it was legally allowed to park, but it was blocking. Um, Site distance uh, for uh, vehicles trying to access um, Third Avenue. So, as we normally would, um, this is an operational issue. Uh, we addressed it uh, via uh, installing several no parking signs, uh, clearing those those lines of sight, so that uh, people could then access safely access uh, Third Avenue. Um, unfortunately. Uh, where we kind of ran afoul of the whole process was um, our operations group. Um, we had put an order in for the signs and asked them to hold until we undertook some public engagement. They went ahead and installed the signs. Uh, that's where we dropped the ball. So uh, we would have been either uh, our plan was to send out notifications and deal with uh, concerns from the residents or have a public meeting. Uh, no, there, neither of those things happened. Uh, we are aware that was 
was an issue uh, with communications and city manager and both engineering have owned that. Um, but we would have ended up here anyway, because uh, it was a safety issue. Um, it's not an issue and it's an operational issue. We deal with this all the time. Uh, certainly not to this degree though. Uh, Tyler has been doing it um, for, you know, we've had records from, you should do it, see about 10 to 12 of these issues a year. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty simplistic in, in resolving them. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was one a, a little bit more um, detailed uh, and a little bit larger than we normally deal with. So um, we backtracked uh, one of the other items we looked at was turning radii uh, for emergency vehicles and larger vehicles from third accessing onto Sherman uh, in accordance with how we normally would look at these. We put a turning template onto a plan. It looked like it wouldn't, wasn't gonna work. So we added additional signs. Um, city manager asked us to take another look at it uh, with public safety, we did. We took a couple field tests last week and came to the conclusion that our turning templates were a little on the conservative side. So we are gonna be adjusting some signs out there on Sherman to put a couple more parking spaces back in the, in the neighborhood. Um, we are working on several uh, asset management projects uh, in the area. There's gonna be a water line. Uh, it's actually now uh, starting um, this month on 3rd Avenue coming from Main Street going to the West. Uh, so we will be uh, working uh, in the the Third Avenue corridor. Um, there are uh, there's going to be a storm drainage project between Sherman and Francis coming later this year. We've been asked to accelerate that, uh, and then we'll follow up next year with a um, an asphalt rehab project of Third Avenue. So um, knowing that we're going to be out there, um, basically uh, rebuilding the road. Anyway, we Harold Harold Dominguez, city manager, has asked us to look at uh, if there's opportunities to provide some uh, curb extensions, um, change lanes to provide or return those parking spaces back in that area. And so we are in the process of working on hiring a designer to go out there and take a look at it, uh, come up with a plan, which we would then vet through a public process, make sure everybody's aware of what we're doing. Um, and what the expectations are. We hope to have that done by later this year. Um, and that is really what the, the kind of the, the backstory and the plan moving forward. So happy to answer any questions if you have any. Looks uh, like Steve, Steve has a question. Yeah, real quick, Jim. So um, I understand the line of sight and, and the issue that the cars maybe cause some obstruction. What about the vulnerable users that might be using Third Avenue? Um, how's that going to be taken into account? Because you can't physically widen that space. And so with those parking spots there, if you were going to do any sort of, uh, you know, bike lane or anything else, that's obviously going to be a whole nother issue in and of itself. So has there been any discussion about what that looks like? Um, and I think, you know, what, what I would hope is, is why I would get a, a, a designer outside of, um, outside of city staff is to come in and look at it holistically. We wanna be able to move cars, peds, um, bikes. Uh, granted, the bikes would be Sharrows. Um, we're not looking to install bike lanes. Uh, it's just not enough room in the corridor. Um, but I don't know that in, in this particular area, we can, we can still provide bike or provide cars or allow for parking on both sides of the street. So the goal would be to find as many parking spaces as we can and still make it safe. Safety is the, the key key issue here. Okay, so there's opportunities here for, you know, to improve pedestrian facilities, uh, traffic mitigation. Um, we're probably gonna be looking at, at speed tables uh, along third to slow traffic down. You know, that has been a historic problem uh, since the speed limit was lowered several years ago. Um, safe crossings is another thing we heard. So we're gonna look at all of that uh, and trying to find the best places and, and make it the safest. A uh, little more lighting in some areas as well was was discussed as well. So um, we'll look at it. I don't know what, what we're gonna come out of it, but we'll probably be back in front of you talking about this in the fall with a plan. Thank you, Jim. Um, Phil did send us a link to the, the March 7th meeting. It was an hour and 47 minutes and some seconds. And so if you have some time, you can listen. Um, 
it is an operational issue that uh, the city looks at. It's not left to the transportation advisory board to make that decision because it's an operational issue. So there were a lot of people at the meeting and they had a lot of things to say. Staff had a lot of, they they answered the questions. And um, anyway, I, I thought it was good. I, I appreciated hearing the whole story. So from, from that hour and 47 minutes. Okay, um, Joe, do you have any um, question, yeah, um, comments for, for the staff for do not. From today? You do no, not. Thank you. Okay. And let's see, I guess, Liz, you, you already talked to us? No. Oh, okay, Liz. So um, thank you, Sandra. Uh, I wanted to just mention, uh, uh, board member Michelle had been said that we hadn't talked about 3rd Avenue. We did a little bit in January mm -hmm. when some callers called in, mm -hmm. um, and they were both saying that the city had done yes. it right. So it's good to have both sides and opportunities for both sides to be heard. What this is pointing out to me is the thing we talked about last month and the month before about outreach. What we do and what we don't do is something that might be communicated better. And here there's all this kerfluffle and nobody called in tonight either. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm thinking we're not getting the information out to people how they can participate at a, a ground level and understand. Um, it took us a long time to get uh, another board member as well. So we probably have some communication things we might need to be continuing to think about. And again, thanks to RTD and everybody. This was a really informative evening. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember the public engagement that took place on 9th Street, not far from my house and um, Tyler and staff came out and they were they were taking um, from west of um, uh, Hover to Airport Road and how they were going to add bike lanes and they were going to narrow lanes. And it was really important that that did happen. There were a lot of people there. They um, listened to what we, the concerns that um, the residents around the area had. Um, and then they um, took that back and they made some changes on their plans. And um, it's it's smooth sailing down um, that part of uh, 9th Street and there's bike lanes and it's, it's just good. And there's uh, speed telling you how fast you're going. And so I appreciated that city uh, took the time, transportation took the time to invite us to engage the community and ask questions and hear about the project. So to piggyback on what you said, um, Liz, it's important that we do communicate and we give the residents an opportunity to be engaged. And I just wanna say that I have heard RTD speak three times and it's, Every time I hear them speak, I understand more about their whole process and um, it doesn't move fast, making changes with RTD and getting people on board. But I appreciated the effort of all RTD staff being here and our commissioners or directors of RTD coming and joining us and speaking to us tonight. So thank you, um, Phil and Jim for providing that opportunity. All right, do we have, uh, I don't think, uh, um, Council member Yarbrough came this evening, did she? Okay, so we don't have any comments from her. Um, information on updating up, upcoming transportation related meeting. Um, Phil put in here the virtual or in-person survey that was sent to everyone to make sure that you take time to fill that out. Or did you wanna say more about that, Phil? No, yeah. No, just, this is a, Kind of a pivotal time, right? I mean, it's the, the city council's decided that uh, March 29th will be their first in person meeting again. And we don't know what's going to happen, obviously, and these things might change, but uh, would, would hope that everyone on this board was able to uh, at least take part in that survey and give us your opinions on uh, how you think we should move forward with this, with this format or, or with uh, in person format. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, um, you made a, a note in the chat. Can you uh, unmute yourself and do you have any comments this evening you want uh, us to hear? She's been having some problems with the web. 
I've been having s several issues as well, both sound and video periodically throughout the session. And Liz, you have too? Okay, Diane, I heard my name, but your question, Sandra, do you have any comments um, being a board member that you wanna say this evening about our meeting? Okay, I'm not hearing anything or seeing anything written. Um, items for upcoming agenda, April 11th, 2022. Can you, can you hear me? I yes. I'm a little bit late. I don't yes. know if you can. I can hear you. I do have an, I do have an interesting link I'd like to share. Um, it's a little bit of a long read, but it, it kind of gives a good history of, of trans mass transportation through the ages, if you will, and and things that drive transportation. And I think it presentation we had tonight, and you would all find it interesting. Um, do you mind if I forward that link after the meeting? No, I, Phil, isn't that great? Yeah, you can you can send that to me, Diane, and I will uh, we'll get that out. I have some other things I wanted to send the link for that upcoming. Uh, 119 meeting as well, yeah. and then we'll send the presentation to everyone from RTD. So you have that uh, in case you want to see it. Thank so you. I'll send all oh, three that things. would be great. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, thank you for sending that my way. You're welcome. Okay. Phil, did you want to tell us about the any agenda items for April 11th? Um, I really just wanted to say that the bylaws are the big thing for that meeting. Okay. That we know about right now, um, you know, in the next three or four weeks here, we'll probably have something else get on there. And I'll, I, I just don't have access to the calendar. I apologize. I made the mistake of coming home to do this meeting, and probably should have just stayed at work because <laughs> I could have seen the the J drive, which is our drive that uh, shows me kind of what's next on the calendar. So, don't have access to that right now. But we will. Uh, I'll send that out as well when we send out the other. Things and Jim has something. Okay. Yes, Jim. Um, so under under future items, uh, we are as a city are currently starting uh, the budget process. Um, we anticipate that the capital improvement program process will open up, uh, where we review all of, um, past projects, kind of that haven't been undertaken yet, and what we're going to be putting into the uh, five year look ahead in future budgets. Um, it's going to be a little bit of an odd year, I think. Uh, this year, from a staff perspective, uh, two major items we're facing is one is actually um, staff shortages. Um, I think in engineering, I'm down about nine positions. Um, overall, that includes utilities, our signals, uh, and of course, our tra traffic engineer. Um, and then also, uh, one of the challenges that I think will significantly impact budget across the city will be. Uh, the the inflation in prices and commodities we've seen in the last year. Um, in some cases, it's it's 30% to 40% to 50% of a project mm -hmm. budget. Uh, so it's gonna uh, significantly impact what, what we may be able to do in the future. Um, and basically what it ends up doing is just spreading those projects out over a longer period of time. Um, so those are things to kind of ponder and consider. and. And if there's anything we, I think you need, you want to make any recommendations that we staff may want to focus on, or you want more information, uh, we can certainly uh, start talking about it. Um, one other item, though, uh, not necessarily about budget, but um, upcoming traffic meeting or uh, traffic related meeting um, at the uh, uh, center had mentioned um, the public meeting for 9th Avenue residents. One of the call ins were talked about. Uh, concerns with speeding on Gay Street. Mm -hmm. um, the residents of Gay Street have put in an application for our traffic mitigation. Uh, one of part of that process is to hold a neighborhood meeting. We are currently scheduling that. Um, I would anticipate, I'm probably gonna push it out. It'll probably be uh, second or third week in April is what I would be looking for. It would be an in-person meeting, um, probably either at the sc local school or at the senior center. So um, we'll push it out beyond this next meeting, but we'll make sure you're notified. 
Um, so it's usually a, a public meeting where we get together talk with the residents. Talk about possibilities, and what we're going to do. Um, 1 of the directions Harold gave me recently is put in some temporary speed tables on. Um, 3rd Avenue, so there's an opportunity, I think, to to do some of that work on gay street as well. So we'll let you know when that meeting is. So, Jim, would you like for us to attend those kind of meetings? If we're available, even though we may not live on gay or close to gay. Sure, why not? Okay, okay. I'll be okay. there. Well, just to <laughs> I, I think it's an opportunity, opportunity to learn, uh, see, see, kind of some of that public engagement, and then right. if you any, uh, you know, always ask for any constructive criticism of how we're holding them. Um, it's going to be one of the first meetings we're doing in person. Again, we've done it in the past where we held a public <laughs> meeting. Uh, based on an application and no one from the public showed up. Uh, so we really didn't do anything in that neighborhood. Haven't heard anything since. So, uh, but these, these people here were, there, there's going to be a lot going on in gay street. Gay street is it's being ripped up now uh, for a water line uh, paving on that road will not occur or a, a complete resurfacing. The, the contractor will repave it now the trench, but complete resurfacing won't happen for 2024. It's also where one of our EMUP corridors, enhanced multi-use corridors, uh, was for a future. That is something we're going to look at because the residents have already indicated they don't want us to take away their parking for bigger bike lanes. The road already has bike lanes on it. So that's going to be an effort we're going to look at and, and engage with the public. But this is about traffic calming uh, and traffic mitigation, neighborhood mitigation. So okay. it's an opportunity, I think, for everybody to, to sit down with them, hear what they have to say. Uh, talk about what we can do, what we can't do, and then we'll we'll see where it goes. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? I just had one last item. It just yes. kind of yes. sorry. It do, it does kind of go back to what Jim was talking about as far as budget, and we will be bringing up to the TAB the um, our future transportation improvement program requests. That we do through Dr. Cog. I think we talked about that at a couple meeting or last meeting in February. But we will be bringing the, the specific projects back to you. Maybe not in April, but uh, in the near near future, you'll get to see how we're pursuing federal dollars and those grant dollars and state dollars to kind of supplement some of the budget issues that we're having with uh, cost escalations and different things like that. So uh, those will come before this board uh, in the near future. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, I'm going to adjourn our meeting at 727 and we'll see you all back on April the 11th. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you staff. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>